scale. These we call them an architect scale or engineer scale. They just measure the feet out for you. So one foot or one inch equals four feet is a common scale. That allows you to take the kind of larger plot that you're working with and put it on a sheet of you know, eight and a half by 11 paper. Just the visualization can help. Um, you see kind of plotting mature plants, pathways, you know, hardscape. Uh, on a piece of paper before you go out and start to purchase plants and materials. So scale, um, this is kind of just a guide to balancing proportions in your garden. Uh, scale creates an environment that looks and feels good. You're also creating depth and layering uh, by having plants of different proportions. So the image in the uh, screen here is a shot in Morro Bay. That's of my front garden. So you want to pick kind of a focal point uh, plant and you have a perspective or a vignette you're trying to anchor down. So in this one, that would be the tree aloe. So it's large, you know, that, that tree in the, it's probably eight to 10 feet tall. So that's going to be visually your anchor there. It's going to hold down the space. It's the largest plant in the garden. Uh, good place to kind of rest your eyes on. Going down from that, you're kind of scaling down proportion wise, you could use a shrub, and this would be this protea here. So we're in kind of the five to six foot range, scaling down from the eight to 12 foot, creating some depth in the landscape and different texture too. Mm -hmm. And then you step down again, kind of in the three to four foot range. So this could be um, this agave here, um, this perennial here, grasses, um, anything in that kind of three to four foot, which is a common uh, perennial grass, succulent size. So combining these three, you start to create kind of a visually anchoring scheme. Um, and there's balance in the proportion here. Second principle is unity um, or rhythm. Rhythm is really just creating unity in the garden. So this is repetition of similar plants, uh, textures or colors to form a theme. So having a theme in the garden just allows you to use a big diversity of plants <clears throat> and certain anchors of that theme kind of tie the composition together. So in this shot, uh, we're doing Kind of linear, I would say, plants, uh, the yuccas, slender leaves, <clears throat> as kind of the overall anchor. So up front, we have kind of a low sized clump that's wide, this blue flame. So this is kind of your three to four foot plant. Uh, and then what we've repeated are these linear plants. So we've got this agave here, this is agave gemmaflora. We've got two yuccas in the background, you know, different sizes, but they're repeating that same foliage texture. And then we have a large Bocarnia uh, bottle palm in the upper corner. So slightly wider leaves, but still that grassy form. So with that repetition, it, it leads your eye through the space. Uh, there's some unity starting to build. Other repetition, now uh, we've used this ground cover, Daimondia to sweep the path. So we've got some little echeverias kind of poking out of that for some fun uh, moments there. And then we've picked up that diamondi again on the other side of the path. So the eye just likes to see familiarity within the space. And then you can dress it up with lots of variety in between. Now there's one-offs here like this adenium. Uh, there's an acacia cousin it up against the building here. Uh, so there's lots of diversity you can do. Um, and still that composition is kind of held together with your more major elements that we're developing. So form, texture, and contrast. Um, this landscape is from a good friend of mine, uh, Nick Wilkinson at Botanica Nova. Uh, he allowed me to photograph this. So I, I love the usage of different textures here. Uh, and form. So as opposed to kind of a felt texture, 
when we're talking landscaping, it's more of a visual texture. So when we're saying a fine texture, that would be this bamboo in the backdrop. This is this weeping uh, Mexican bamboo over Taya. So a very fine texture, small leaves, has a cascading effect also, so kind of soft. Uh, right in front, we have the whale's tongue agave, agave avatifolia. So very like kind of oversized wide leaves, just a jumbo kind of prehistoric presence there. So those two juxtaposed against each other create that texture. We have a very coarse plant uh, in front of a very fine textured plant in the backdrop. We're also playing here with uh, kind of a medium texture plant, I'd say, this yucca bright star. And then we have some um, kind of horizontal, some linear panels going across in the accent panel there. Um, so creating just visual interest through contrast of textures uh, through different plants. It's just another illustration. Um, repetition and contrast. So I'd say as the anchor, this acanthus in the back is dark green, really large oversized leaves. Um, up front, we have this variegated agave, which uh, just reads very bright. It's got that yellow creamy variegation. And then we've repeated it a couple times. So it's on the side, uh, kind of disappears into the landscape. And then we have small accent elements up front. So aeoniums, um, some hellebores popping out, some small pink echeveria, little highlights here. So we're just developing that theme again by having kind of a large eye-catching plant that we're repeating through the space. And then a big kind of dark leafy anchor in the background. This is a little bit more of a perennial space, just a similar kind of abundance theme. So these clients wanted a lot of volume, a lot of diversity in the garden. So we use the kangaroo paws to accomplish that. So this is a bigger growing variety and they bloom. These are almost six feet tall. Um, so the whole garden kind of erupts when these are blooming and we use quite a few of them. So they are kind of dotted throughout the space. So you get that strong sense of kind of the abundance theme. Uh, some foliage contrast is still nice. So we're working with kind of grassier texture on these kangaroo paws, thin leaves. Uh, and then we're looking at succulents to provide kind of the big, chunky, more oversized leaves, of coarse foliage. So the common foxtail agave, and then uh, blue chalk sticks up front here. So we can dig into some different kind of plant families. Uh, I would start by saying the softer side of succulents. So these are gonna be uh, echeverias, uh, aeoniums, uh, crassula. Crassula is a big family. So those are gonna be all your sedums, uh, dudlia, calanchoe, a lot of small ground cover type plants. These are easy plants to fall in love with. Uh, really jewel tone colors, they're very pretty. Uh, they tend to form nice little colonies. Uh, they will puff out, as you can see, this is the snowball echeveria. Uh, I planted a couple of these and they're an edging along the garden that kind of weaves through like a river. Uh, so they are naturally spreading, they propagate well. Um, yeah, and they're just kind of delightful with these little cherry flowers. This is a photo grid on just the types. Um, yeah, they range in those jewel tones. So they tend to be a lot of aqua, pink, lavender, uh, those fuzzy types that have this tomentum on them. Uh, so they're, yeah, they're charming. They're kind of collectible. I would say there's a lot of people that just collect at your areas uh, for their form and different colors in the garden. Uh, these are two types I wanted to highlight. So Echeveria agavoides uh, on the left. I'll show this in a bigger slide where there's a couple of clumps. Uh, this one is actually cold hardy. Most Echeverias 
aren't too cold hardy. This one will take around 25 degrees. So it's even uh, kind of some milder exposures in North County hardy. And then the snowball, which we already talked a little bit about, um, just a wonderful, dependable edging plant. Uh, blooms in the spring. It's got this very pretty kind of pale chalky tone. It's a great plant to grow. A few other favorites, uh, the ruffle types. So these are hybrids, but they have these ruffly wavy forms. Uh, definitely that undersea creature vibe to them. You can do whole themed gardens of like coral type, different undersea succulents. And actually very afterglow. Uh, this color of, is kind of hard to describe on this one. It really varies through the season. It's kind of a chameleon, uh, but pink, it's got kind of this hot pink edge to it. It's kind of aqua to, so yeah, lavender tones in the center. Uh, it will also pop out to form small colonies. And this one tends to be pretty long lived. Some echeverias, you only get a couple of years in the garden. Uh, these I've seen be more durable. So echeveria vignettes, um, they look good planted together. So I've just dedicated little beds just to echeveria's kind of variations on the theme. So they have similar um, size, shapes, textures, but variation within the colors uh, and kind of, you know, the neat edges, the margins. So they can be uh, kind of a neat plant to duplicate in different forms throughout a bed. Um, this is the Echeveria agravoides. In the previous slide, you can see the tips. And this cultivar is ebony, get really dark, kind of almost a burgundy blackish color. And then this one is more of a limey green with the red tips. That one is lipstick. Um, yeah, both very durable. So Aeonium, these are probably the most commonly known succulent, maybe next to jades. Uh, very easy to grow. Uh, they're good kind of front of the border to mid border plants. Some of them can get fairly tall. Um, really good bloomers. Uh, usually spring bloomers. So these I'll show on the next slide, kind of cone shaped, um, large inflorescence and white to creamy colors in yellow. They're best on the coast. They're kind of frost sensitive. Um, they don't do really well in heat or inland. They're really a coastal plant. Some really nice colors. Uh, this is a really dark kind of purplish black uh, variety called Jort Pop. I'll show a few others in the next slide. I said big flower power on these. This is my daughter next to it probably 30 inches tall. So these are easily six feet to taller. So they can really be a bold, uh, striking focal point in the garden when they bloom. These are the also succulents that people say, you know, break off a piece and stick it in the dirt. Uh, that's really true with these. They are that easy to root. Uh, you don't even need to callus them. You know, you can really break it off and stick it in the soil. And you've got another plant in about a month or two. They're winter growers, so kind of at a lull in the garden when most people expect not as much going on, we get a little rain. Uh, that's when these rosettes and the leaves really kind of plump up and um, come into their own. So they're usually a blooming and kind of late winter to spring. So they fill a good niche there. Two good varieties, the uh, undulatum. That's the plant in the previous slide also, it's a larger grower. Uh, undulations in the leaf edges, you can see a little waviness in the foliage here. Uh, it's a little more evident probably in these. So they have a nice texture as they wave back and forth. AOM Sunburst is a well-known cultivar. It's got that tricolor effect. Uh, it's a big rosette, the rosettes can get Probably about a foot across. Its smaller cousin, uh, Sunburst, is called Kiwi. So this is just a dependable ground cover. 
Got a similar effect with the yellow, the pink, and the green alternating. It's a really dense you know, carpeting plant. It will definitely smother out weeds. Um, yeah, just always cheery in the garden. Nice flowers, propagates very easily, kind of self-repairing. Aeonium velour. Um, if you want a denser Aeonium, this is kind of that mid-size range, 18 to 24 inches. Some Aeoniums can get leggy and a little bit tall, stemmy. Some people don't like that to see the trunk. These are so dense, they're really like a shrub. Um, that color combo of the burgundy and the lime green is a nice contrast. Um, and these will bloom pretty big too when they get established. So all these species uh, mix well together. So this is a shot just of a few. You can see in the backdrop, there are some of these curly echeverias peeking over. Um, boulders and rocks can really anchor your garden space. So this is an entry up to a patio. Up here, so we frame the entry in with rocks. Uh, and then you're kind of carpeting, softening the entry with some of these different sedums in here. We've so got some big headed aeoniums in here. So yeah, they're all, they mix well together. And uh, rock is a natural grounding point for them. Dudleyas, um, these guys you'll find, this is a Central Coast native too. Um, you'll find them often on the bluffs, just looks like they're hanging vertical. So they're cliffhangers. Uh, they naturally are kind of using rocks as an anchor point to root around. So when we use them in the garden, you need to take a little more precaution. You need to plant them on a little bit of a tilt to kind of mimic that environment. Um, really, that's for drainage. If you plant them flat, um, they can get water that will get trapped in the crown there and can rock them fairly easily. So you can see they're kind of up on a little bit of a slant here. Um, so they look great tucked in rocks. They need very little soil. They're a good crevice plant. If you have spots um, between different areas that you have just a little niche pocket, they're good for filling those. Uh, eye catching. So that chalky color is really, it can be a beacon in the garden. It reflects a lot of light. So it's a nice kind of that whitish silver contrast to other darker green burgundy plants as well. These are very drought tolerant. So uh, once they're established, you can totally withhold the water. In fact, they want to be withheld. They want to be dry once they're established. They will go through a little bit of a dormancy period where they take a rest. They'll even kind of curl up the leaves a little. And then similar to the aeoniums, they kind of like rebirth as soon as the rains come again in our fall winter. So yeah, Central Coast native. Uh, there's lots of variation of these. They are endemic throughout the Channel Islands. So all throughout um, Anna Kappa and Santa Cruz Island, there's many varieties. They mix well with other wildflowers. So our California fuchsia here. Uh, this one's growing kind of a little bit tucked underneath the manzanita. And the blooms last for a long time. So they emerge in spring as a kind of a pink tone, and then they'll age and get this really brick red. And the seed isn't mature till late summer fall. So a long bloom period of uh, interest. The inflorescences are pretty neat looking. So I'll move into the aloe tribe now. So um, aloes are a really large class of succulent plants also. They're the big bloomers. So they're uh, repeat bloomers every year, typically winter to spring, um, really kind of large inflorescence plants. So they're impressive bloomers. These long tubular flowers are just magnets for hummingbirds and bees. So they're a great nectar plant uh, and they kind of bloom when you could use a little bit of inspiration in that the lull of winter, they start uh, budding and blooming. They're very warm tones, mostly yellows, oranges, and reds. 
they are very versatile also. So I'll show a few slides, but really ground cover type plants all the way through trees. Uh, they have kind of a larger rosette form like an agave, but they're much softer. So if you're looking for kind of a mid-sized plant, um, more of a blooming kind of shrubby like presence, um, they have that stature, but most of them are unarmed. So they don't have spines and leaves like many agaves or yuccas. Warmer tones, they mentioned in the flowers. You can see in the photo grid, there are some variation in all the uh, flower arrangements. So that versatility in the size. So in the middle shot, you can see there's me at the base of this tree aloe. So these can be uh, specimen plants and be fairly fast growing some of the tree types. This plant's probably 40 years old. Um, it's probably about 40 feet tall. Um, so they can be a great kind of, yeah, definitely a nice focal point in the garden. You wanna plan for that mature size too if you're getting one, because uh, they do grow large. Allo uh, speciosa on the left. These have just fantastic flowers. So they open as kind of pink buds. And as they mature, they get these green and white stripes. And then these bright red anthers pop out of them. Um, these are larks. These are probably a foot tall, these flower cones. Uh, the fan aloe was one other to highlight. It's just a unique aloe. It's uh, fan shaped clusters of leaves. Always reminding me of a menorah. Um, great bloomer in the spring. They can be very old and um, kind of dense, and they don't get that tall. So you can have a pretty old plant, you know. 15 to 20 years old and they'll only be three feet tall. And they develop this neat kind of bonsai structure with a trunk. Uh, two others to highlight, uh, the mountain aloe. So these have one of the largest aloe blooms, this candelabra-like inflorescence. So they really spread out wide. You know, it's probably a three foot wide bloom. You can see it again in the slide on the right here in the back of the garden. So these are just a, kind of a party of bees when they tend to go off. There's always some action going on when they're blooming. This is aloe moon glow that we repeated a few times in front of it. So there's been a lot of hybridization in the aloes to be smaller compact plants. So these are about three feet tall and just very floriferous too. Uh, so you don't have to grow the tree aloes or the larger shrubby types. There's a lot of compact varieties as well. So the spiny side. Um, so after your thirst is maybe quenched by a lot of softer succulents, uh, you might be curious about these guys. Uh, they take a little bit getting used to. Uh, they take some time and working around to make sure you don't get stabbed, but you can develop a healthy respect and uh, they really are fascinating plants. Um, the geometry is much more striking because they're more rigid plants. So they really have kind of that living sculpture look. Uh, these are also the hardier plants as well. So if you're in colder climates that frost, uh, the northern part of the county or even you know, inland slightly, um, even parts of AG, you know, some of those can get fairly cold. They're also the most uh, drought tolerant and uh, minimal maintenance. So they're largely kind of a uh, self-reliant plant. They don't need a lot of care after you get them in the ground and rooted for the first year. So anyone know the main difference between succulents and cacti? Uh, they often get lumped together. So the presence of areoles. Uh, areoles are these fuzzy little bumps uh, in which many, who knows how long ago, thousands of years, uh, cacti shed their leaves in response to some environmental stressors. So leaves were causing more evaporation, 
uh, water loss from the plant. So they shed those and became a uh, photosynthetic stem. That's what cacti are. They're just a leafless stem. So out of these aerials, these are kind of a multidiscipline application. They can sprout uh, flower buds. They can sprout new branches. Uh, and there's usually protective thorns here. Um, so those can't be uh, eaten or messed with. So cacti specialize in having these aerials. That's really what differentiates them from succulents. Um, so there's kind of a riddle that all cacti are succulents because they have water held in their tissue, but not all succulents are cacti. So all cacti are succulents, not all succulents are cacti. And you can identify them by the presence of those aerials or not. Um, the very spiny ones that you see, these are all aerials in here. And they'll have a combination of these large kind of macro spines and then very small spines um, that are hard to see and hard to get out if you bump into them. Uh, sleek lines and spines. So I mentioned the geometry of these plants is striking. Um, columnar cacti are probably the most well known. This is a San Pedro in the middle. Uh, if you're looking to get into growing some cacti, this is probably one of the best I would recommend. Easiest, fast growing for a cactus. Uh, the spines are pretty minimal on these. You can handle them uh, pretty well just with regular gloves. They have very pretty white shaped trumpet flowers that are night blooming also. Uh, so the agaves, you can just see that neat kind of repeated geometry there, uh, very clean lines. And prickly pears are the apuntias. Um, so there are spineless forms of these also. Uh, the flowers are really neat. They tend to be warm tones of yellow, uh, reds. This is apuntia santa rita, which gets a lot of purple in the foliage. Uh, as it gets stressed. So cold exposure in the winter and drought in the summer will turn these you know, almost completely kind of a lavender tone. This one's a nice compact grower. It only gets about three feet also. So I wanted to highlight some agaves that are softer too, um, that don't need to be, they're not into the spines. So these are kind of compliments to that undersea theme. Uh, the squid agave is on the left here. It's a smallish plant, usually around two to three feet max. Um, pretty slow growing. This is a variegated selection. Um, nice recurved foliage, so neat posture to that plant. It has a lot of movement to it. And on the right, we have the octopus agave. Uh, so larger, this one's pretty fast growing. This is also a variegated type called stained glass. Uh, yeah, really striking in the arching position of that, the foliage there. So both are very friendly and easy to use in the garden. Uh, Want to touch just on safe handling. So there are techniques and you don't have to get stabbed. Uh, when handling these. So I like to use a sling. So using a towel to actually wrap up that rosette that's spiny, like this barrel cactus here, allows you to not touch that plant. On the left, uh, you're using a towel as a sling. This is uh, two people on my team moving a lawn euphorbia here. So you would pre-dig that hole and you can put the root ball in and really just stand it up with the sling. Uh, you can usually stake these if they're tall. Uh, but if you plan out your movements here, uh, it's pretty easy to transport these and uh, move them without getting stabbed. Uh, just some different applications on succulents. So they're a really natural fit with containers. Uh, they're kind of shallow rooted, so they don't need a real deep um, pot. Uh, they tend to go wide, they spread out for their water collection, but usually they're, they're not super deep. So you'll see these shallow dishes that are done. These are um, 
there's any tractor discs that you can buy fairly affordably online and you can plant them there. These are probably maybe four to five inches deep. So you make little dish gardens uh, with them and the succulents adapt well. They're good uh, mixed companions also. This is a potting arrangement from a client of mine uh, with Quan Yin in the center. Uh, some chivarias, imbricata. There's a kiwi, that aeonium that we highlighted, and there's a woolly bush in the background. So they, they grow well with other drought tolerant plants. Uh, you can make your own metal planters too, pretty affordably. Um, these are. Um, 18 wheeler brake drums. So these are actually scrap after they uh, have kind of extended their useful life. You'll find them at scrap yards. They're usually throwing them away. So I have them save them for me. They make good pots with these neat ridges on them. Uh, so if you like the rust effect, uh, most sheet metal makes a great container and will rust naturally. So this is corrugated metal, it's steel. Um, you can really kind of cut these to a height that you want and you just bend them in a circle and you can screw them together at the ends. So you can make uh, some pretty simple pottery and put in the garden um, with a few sheet metal skills. If you like the tin effect, like the more galvanized pale metal. Um, this was a planter built out of wood, just treated wood and then we skirted it or faced it uh, with the old tin. So you can add some neat patina and texture to just, yeah, a common pot. You can even wrap it in metal. So mixed gardens, um, kind of the best of both worlds. So again, succulents are part of that solution for a water-wise garden. So this is uh, my front yard here. So. Mostly this is a native area. So we've got our California buckwheat uh, up front. that's kind of colonized into areas that are native lime grass. There's some white sage back here. Um, and then you can see we've got some agaves kind of poking out here, big variegated rosettes. And then there's aeonium undulatum. And there's aeonium sunburst here. So succulents can be kind of highlights or accents within, uh, you know, mostly perennial or native garden. Uh, another example of just common perennials people like to use. So the red hot pokers uh, here and then the kangaroo paws up front. So both good long blooming plants. And then you've got these bold agave rosettes. This is just a common agave attenuata. Uh, it's a variegated form of that called stripes. So that was my last slide. I just wanted to thank you all for being here uh, as part of the program. Um, if you want to follow up with me, I'm always open to email questions. Um, I'll forward a slide to the book. So this is kind of a preview. I dig into it further uh, in the book that was just released. So uh, this is available everywhere online. Uh, you can get it locally from a few places, uh, Growing Grounds downtown, Guru Records uh, at Slow Botanical Garden. Um, if you want signed copies, you can order them from my website or get a hold of me also. Thank you all. Appreciate your uh, willingness to have me on.